This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Sign up for our daily News Digest email by texting the word Democracy Now!, one word, no space, to 66866 today. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. While India is facing a public health catastrophe from surging COVID-19 cases, the United States reached a milestone Wednesday, with the White House reporting it's reached its goal of administering 200 million vaccine doses within President Biden's first 100 days. He'd originally aimed for 100 million. This comes as the U.S. and other wealthy members of the World Trade Organization continue to fight efforts, led by India, to force Force Big Pharma to waive patent rights to help address the crisis. To talk more about the state of the pandemic in the United States and abroad, we're joined by Dr. Peter Hotez, co-director of the Center for Vaccine Development at Texas Children's Hospital, dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine. He also has a new book out. It's called Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. And he's part of a team at Baylor, which is working with a private Indian company to develop a low-cost COVID vaccine. Dr. Hotez, welcome back to Democracy Now! We just oh, finished so talking— Oh, for having me. It's great to have you. We just finished talking with Rana Ayub, the Washington Post opinions editor in India, describing the COVID storm that they are experiencing there. Um, you are coming up with a plan for a low-cost vaccine working with an Indian company. Can you explain what this means and what are the obstacles to it? Yeah, and it's it's not only just for India. What, what we need is a simple, easy-to-use, low-cost, some people call it people's vaccine for the world, um, because the task is daunting. We have a, a 1.1 billion people in sub-Saharan Africa, roughly 650 million people in Latin America, at least, you know, close to half a billion or more in low-income areas of Asia. So you multiply that times two, we're talking about 5 billion doses of vaccine. And the question is, where, do, where, does, where do you get 5 billion doses of vaccine? You know, the mRNA technology is extremely exciting. Uh, but it's it's new, and whether or not you could ever scale it to that in time for this pandemic is is really questionable. So, what else can we come up with? Uh, there's the adenovirus vectored vaccines from AstraZeneca and J and J. Uh, there's going to be some issues around vaccine acceptance. Hopefully, that will resolve. But in the meantime, we're trying to come through with something that uses the same old school technology as the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine that's been around for four decades. It's a microbial uh, fermentation expressed recombinant protein and yeast, and, and it looks really good. It's uh, in phase, finishing now phase two clinical trials in India uh, and, uh, and great protection in non-human primates, and now working with Biological E, uh, one of the big private companies like Serum Institute of India, uh, in, and they're based in Hyderabad, they're now scaling it up to a billion doses. And that's really exciting, and hopefully it could be released for emergency use authorization uh, by this summer in India. But then what about the rest of the world? Um, in the Biological E is committed to, I think, uh, uh, providing about 70 percent of its vaccines to the COVAX sharing facility. But could we get uh, another group to come along and help us with another 4 billion doses? And and it would be great if the U.S. government could could have a role in that and, and help reassert some leadership in global health. Uh, Dr. Hotez, the biological E vaccine is reportedly going to cost uh, only a dollar fifty per dose. Could you talk about why it is uh, People, some people have raised the question of why it is that a more accessible, cheaper vaccine that could easily be transported and stored, why such a vaccine was not invested in earlier, not developed earlier, and whether that could have happened with investment from uh, rich countries. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's an important. You asked probably the most important question, and. And we asked it ourselves because we'd been developing uh, coronavirus vaccines for the last 10 years. We work on vaccines for diseases of the poor, that vaccines that no one else will make. We have a vaccine for schistosomiasis in clinical trials. That's a huge problem in Africa for Chagas disease in Latin America. And we adopted a coronavirus 
vaccine program 10 years ago, because at that time, nobody cared about coronavirus vaccines. It was also uh, orphaned. And we figured out how to deliver the spike protein as a, as a low-cost recombinant protein vaccine. And when we got the COVID-19 sequence in January, our team, which is just co-headed by myself and Mary Elena Batazzi, we've worked together for 20 years, we turned that around really quickly. And and um, and then we couldn't raise money for it because everybody was so focused on innovation. It was all about innovation, and they wanted mRNA and adenovirus vectored vaccines. And I said, that's great, but you know, what if you can't scale it, or what if there's a safety signal? Don't you want a simple, low-cost vaccine as a backup? And we just couldn't get anybody to move. So I wound up raising money privately. Um, from philanthropies here in Texas, like the Clayburg Foundation and Tito's Vodka of all places and and the JPB Foundation, they came through. I raised about four or five million dollars. And then we were able to make that scale up that vaccine and transfer it to biological E. I often think, though, I'd, if I hadn't had to spend the first few months of the pandemic uh, going out trying to raise money, we could have uh, maybe had something ready to go right now. So you know, I think I can't complain about the vaccines that we do have. Um, I myself have gotten the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine, and I'm very grateful for it. But we, you know, with, there wasn't enough attention paid to an unfussy, simple, durable, easy breezy vaccine uh, for resource poor countries, which is what we've been doing. And hopefully now we can uh, move this along pretty quickly. Now, uh, CEPI. The Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation is really helping of Biological E. Um, they're, they're helping support the manufacturer, and I'm really grateful for that. Uh, and so we're trying to move as quickly as we can right now. Dr. Hotez, could you also talk about some of the other constraints on developing and disseminating vaccines widely? Uh, the U.S. has also come under criticism in addition to uh, patent rights, uh, for maintaining patent rights on these vaccines. It's also come under criticism for the ban that it's placed on exporting the raw material for vaccines. Could you talk about what exactly uh, that ban entails and how it's impacting vaccine efforts around the world? Well, I don't have a lot of details on the ban. Um, one of the things I do know is um, the Biden administration, through uh, the quad uh, meetings, I think, was able to relax some of those constraints to support biological E and allow some of those raw materials through. So I'm very happy that that they did that. Um, you know, the patent issue is one that I'm, I'm often asked about, and and patents are important. One of the things I, I like to say, though, is you know the the model of of patent uh, loosening patent restrictions was very much uh, around small molecule drugs during during the height of the HIV AIDS pandemic and, you know, companies like CIPLA, they needed the freedom to be able to make antiretroviral drugs. And patents are important for vaccines, but the, the most important aspect of vaccines is actually knowing how to make vaccines and knowing how to do it under a quality umbrella with quality control and batch production records, and also having uh, adequate regulatory authorities and TAC. And that actually tends to be a bigger hurdle than the patent, so everybody, you know, focuses on the patents um, based on based on those earlier models for, for small molecule drugs. But the forces and the barriers that are around vaccines is a bit different. What we really need is to train human capital people uh, who know how to do vaccines under a quality umbrella and the National Regulatory Authority and help with the capacity building. So the the point is, even if you relaxed all of the patent restrictions for all the vaccines tomorrow, and I'm not certain how quickly that would translate into vaccines for the world for this pandemic. is a long-term issue, definitely it's it's important, but right now we, I think we have to focus on one, uh, making low-cost, uh, easy, easy to use, uh, durable vaccines available to people in resource countries, as I say, five billion doses, number one. And number two, let's, let's start working out that long process of building capacity. Right now, there are no vaccines made on the African continent, or essentially no vaccines. Uh, not, not much better in Latin America, a little bit better, but not much. Same with the Middle East. And, and that's why I served in the Obama administration, I served as U.S. science envoy to help build up uh, vaccine capacity uh, for uh, Muslim-majority countries in the Middle East and North Africa. It was really exciting and to have the opportunity to do that. But we, we need to figure that out for, for the rest of the world. We're still too dependent on the multinational 
companies for something to filter down. And and you know a lot of the a lot of the innovation right now in the vaccines is not even coming from the big three vaccine companies, Merck, GSK, and Sanofi. It's non-traditional organizations like Moderna and BioNTech and and AstraZeneca, who are not vaccine companies, but are accelerating these new technologies. And and it's really important. I think the innovation is really important. I just wish we'd had, had balanced the portfolio out a bit more uh, with, with low-cost vaccines like ours. Dr. Ashish Jha, of, uh, who heads up the Brown School of Public, Medicine, of Public Health, tweeted earlier today, India's in the throes of horrendous COVID surge, horrendous. They're struggling to get more people vaccinated. We're sitting on 35 to 40 million million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine Americans will never use. Can we please give or lend them to India? Uh, like, maybe now it'll help a lot, he said. I wanted to get your response to that, Dr. Hotez. Also, how much would it cost for the U.S. to invest? I mean, for God's sakes, the U.S. is pulling out of Afghanistan. There are many Congress members who are saying, cut the Pentagon budget. You could take that money saved and pour it into vaccine development, ensuring um, vaccine equity in the world. So it's a two-part question, the AstraZeneca and how much money would it take for the U.S. to give, the way it pours money into weapons development and sales? Yeah. So, um, well, Ashish Jha is, is is a good friend and, and colleague. Uh, uh, he's just a, he's a great man, and and uh, we we talk quite a bit. And I, I didn't know he made that statement about the AstraZeneca vaccine, but uh, I think he's right. We there's no reason to hold on to it. Uh, and and maybe there are other vaccine supplies uh, that the U.S. can can provide for India. Uh, but and I think they should do that. But we should also remember the scale and scope of this problem right now. Um, India, with a population of what is it, 1.2 billion people, they're going to need 900 million to a billion doses to to get to vaccinate their way out of this. So in some ways, it's a drop in the bucket. Yes, they should do it. But again, the the real answer uh, for the coming months is to help accelerate some vaccines uh, like ours. Uh, as far as uh, redirecting redirecting budget. Um, you know, who knows how the Office of Management and Budget works uh, in any administration. But, uh, the, you know, the amount of funding that we would need uh, to uh, scale up production for another 4 billion doses, because remember, it's it's a high producing yeast strain. It's 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 low cost. I, I think we could do it uh, with a very modest budget. Um, I talk a lot with my, my friend Jeffrey Sachs, who's an international development economist. And whenever I tell him about the money uh, we need, he sort of rolls his eyes and he says, oh, my God, this is, Peter, this is a rounding error, with the, the amount of dollars that you're talking about. It's so modest. And, and, and so if we can just uh, mobilize some of that, I think it would be great. Dr. Hotez, very quickly before we conclude, I'd like to ask you about a, a, a recent article you wrote for the BMJ Journal uh, saying that the high death toll from COVID-19 has not arisen from sars cov 2 transmission alone, but also anti-science forces promoting defiance against vaccines. And you talk about the globalization of this anti-vaccine movement. Uh, could you just uh, explain what that is and how that's happened and how to counter it? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, the other hat I wear is uh, a leader in going up against anti-science groups, uh, not by choice, but sort of by default. Uh, because in addition to being a vaccine scientist, I am the parent of four adult kids, and my youngest daughter, Rachel, has autism and intellectual disabilities. And a few years ago, I wrote a book called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which made me public enemy number one with, with the anti-vaccine groups. They call me now the OG villain, which I had to look up. It means original gangster villain. And 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 now I'm what was sort of a fringe element, and, and you're seeing this play out uh, nightly now on conservative news outlets. They're now um, a mainstream uh, and among the conservative parties in the U.S., our Republican Party, and that's really scary. And then you've got um, the Russian government um, launching a, an entire program of what's being called weaponized health communications, trying to discredit Western vaccines in favor of Sputnik V, Sputnik V, or Sputnik V, and and so and now this is globalized, uh, and you're seeing the same kind of far right U.S. QAnon focus uh, around the anti-vaccine movement now appearing and protests in Western European capitals. So I, I call this 
an anti-science uh, empire. I tend to be a bit out there on this uh, in the sense that there's not by any means consensus uh, in, in the global community that it's reached that stage. But, you know, I'm of the opinion that when so many lives were lost in the United States, not only because of COVID-19, but of deliberate defiance to things like masks and social distancing. And now we have four independent news polls all pointing to the the most vaccine hesitant group in the United States or what or what are being called Republicans. Some some polls call it white Republicans. And and that is the reality. There's been a politicization of the anti-science, anti-vaccine movement. And, and we have to figure out a way to dial it back, bring it back. I'm trying to reach out to conservative groups uh, whenever I can, just because we've let this thing get out of hand. Neither the U.S. government or the United Nations agencies has really wanted to confront this and, and really call it out and, uh, you know, uh, express uh, concern to the Putin government and, and confront them on it, express concern in the U.S. about how we've allowed this to globalize. Uh, but we Dr. have to figure out a way to dial this back. Dr. Peter Hotez, I want to thank you for being with us, co-director of the Center for Vaccine Development at Texas Children's Hospital. Congratulations on your new book, Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in a Time of Anti-Science. When we come back, it's Earth Day. We'll hear about the Red Deal. Stay with us.